Jairi is going first. So she has some more time okay. to warm up. Okay. Good afternoon, everybody, and uh, welcome to today's master class. We're so glad that uh, everybody uh, managed through uh, the ugliness of the weather earlier this morning and that it cleared up enough that you're all here. Um, we have a really special guest today. Um, I always like to um, talk about him as, as a um, former faculty member here, a graduate of the Curtis Institute, a native of Chicago, Illinois, one of my favorite cities, and um, currently now a uh, professor of violin at the New England Conservatory and uh, just starting as visiting professor of violin at Yale School of Music. So those are two pretty uh, fantastic places. He's um, a winner of the Paganini International Violin Competition, so he really knows his stuff, as you can guess, on, on violin. So uh, um, with um, uh, no uh, further ado, uh, why don't you all welcome here on the screen, Mr. Subin Kim. Thank you. And, and in honor, in honor of uh, the Paganini winner, um, our first performer today is Jare Shi. Jare is a student of Guillaume Combe, and he'll be playing the Paganini Caprice number seventeen. Jare. Jare, nice to meet you, Jare. I don't know why I don't know why you would want to do this to yourself to play Paganini 17. <laughs> but here you are, so we'll listen to it. <laughs> no, this is this is actually one of the most it should be one of the most fun um, light-hearted caprices. So we'll enjoy it.
Jarre, have you ever performed these in front of an audience? No. Wow, that's amazing, really. All the more, uh, only, only the violinists in the audience who have performed, attempted to perform Paganini can appreciate truly um, how hard, how difficult that is, um, just psychologically, right? So that was that was really wonderful. Um, just for for you and for our audience, a little context with Paganini. I don't know how much you know about Paganini, um, but he was um, first and foremost one of. Oh, can you hear me, Sherry? It's okay. Okay. Um, first and foremost, um, one of, if not the greatest violinist, one of, if not the greatest performers that we've ever had in classical music. <clears throat> And he was really, truly the first superstar, the first rock star. I mean, because at that time there wasn't rock music. Um, he was, re he really paved the way for these superstar magnetic performers. And, but um, he was not just, and as actually as most great performers were at that time, they were not people who executed other composers' music well. They were composers themselves. Um, they were, in the case of someone like Paganini, really kind of an improviser as well, and um, incredibly inventive. And so we always want to approach these caprices, especially in these caprices, um, from that perspective, from the perspective of being Paganini and creating these wondrous sounds rather than thinking of them as very difficult pieces and groups of notes that we have to practice and practice and practice to, to execute well. It's not like, um, I'll tell my students this often, it's not like studying um, for the SAT for a year and then trying to do a good job on it. Or actually even worse, having the answers and memorizing all the answers <laughs> <laughs> and then trying to do well on it. Um, it was very easy, though, to to get drawn into that sort of mindset because it's so difficult. So it does take a lot of practicing, but we want to be inventive. Um, he, Paganini, if you read uh, accounts of Paganini's playing um, from people who were in, the, in his audiences, and everybody went to Paganini's concerts, every artist, writer, um, and, and the general public, for that matter, they all just, he was such a sensation and sold out night after night after night. And, um, and they all went. They had to go. It was probably like um, Elvis or something when he came out. And, um, but it's amazing how consistent some of the accounts are, um, how they talk about him not sounding like a violinist. It didn't sound like a violin. So they're seeing this violinist on stage, holding this violin, playing this violin, but they're hearing other sounds. They're hearing um, a singer. They're hearing French horns. They're hearing flutes. They're hearing trombones. They're hearing animal sounds. They're hearing ghosts. And they're seeing the devil playing in front of them, not a man. You know, all of these, all of these associations and, and images. And so he was a great imitator. He was trying to make the violin make sounds that were not normal for the violin. And I think that was, um, fundamentally, that was what was so unbelievable about his performances not again not just yes he was very good um, but it went beyond that um, so with these caprices use let your imagination run wild yeah i think paganini was probably one of those people who would uh, uh he'd hear a bird sing and then he'd try to play he'd, he'd try to you know try to try to do that he would um hear you know something drop like that and then he might try to imitate it on on the violin um, and i think what you'll find is there is an incredible range of sounds that he was trying to imitate that are far greater than 
the sounds that are on the violin that are that naturally come out of the violin. Does that make sense, Jerry? Okay. Um, so, for instance, at the beginning, let's say in this this little introduction here, okay, um, this dark dramatic introduction. Um, if you were to think of instruments other than a violin, what might you hear playing at the beginning? Brass instruments, okay. How about that register? Trumpet, I would generally think of as higher and brighter. I think more trombone. Trombones, okay. You know what's amazing? I hear trombones too. I don't think that's a coincidence. I think that the, and, and you know, I didn't talk to your teacher. Your teacher didn't talk to me. <laughs> you and I didn't plan this before. It's amazing what these two E flats kind of evokes. Um, and not that there can't be other ideas as well, but I do think, and let's say, how about not just trombone, but trombones, because there's two of them doubling, okay? So try that from the beginning. And how about we're going to add trombones on top, okay? So there's two, uh, so two, and then the top voice goes up to the G flat, and then we add a third one on the A. Good, okay. Now, what I sent, and, and this is your first try at it, you'll practice this, this idea, okay? You're, maybe you're squeezing the sound a little bit, but what is wonderful is you are trying to sound like something much more than a violin. A measly little violin playing double stops. And we feel that already, what you're going for. Even before you've really made the sound, we can feel you going for something more dramatic. And, um, and that's really, really wonderful. Let, now, then we, of course, do have to deal with the nitty-gritty violin techniques um, and finding this first E flat is not not easy. How do you think of it? Do you think of it as finding it from the first finger or from the fourth finger? Uh, from the first and then like, extending the fourth. From the first extending up to the fourth. Okay. Can you uh, let go of your hand? Okay. Now let's see, see you do that. Put the first, find the fourth, and then play it. Okay. So, first of all, you've probably practiced it quite a bit like this, right? And it's not working. It didn't, didn't come out. <laughs> so, it doesn't mean it's a bad idea. But sometimes it does mean that we need to rethink that idea and how we're doing it. First of all, you want to make sure you really practiced it that way. Do you think, did you actually practice this or did you just kind of it went pretty well when you were practicing. Sometimes you'd miss it. You'd do it a second time, it was fine. Is that sort of what it was like? Yeah. Okay. And that's why we have performance practice, which is perfect here. Assume this is going to go wrong, okay? It will. <laughs> so, and, and that's performance experience. Um, I heard a wonderful quote, by the way, a few years ago, Hilary Hahn was giving a master class in and uh, nobody was asking questions, which I hope, I hope people will ask questions afterwards, but nobody was asking. So I raised my hand and I said, Hillary, everybody in this room would love to play more consistently like you do. So what do you suggest? And she said, how, I said, how do you do it? And she said, oh, it's very simple. I've made all the mistakes already. And that was such a wonderful answer. So things have to go wrong sometimes before you realize that it's something that's more difficult than we thought. And this is an example of, of one of those spots. But I would also really recommend to you and all the other students in the room, there are no accidents. Things don't happen. They don't go wrong just once. 
it might be the first time you've noticed it go wrong, or maybe it is the first time that it does go wrong. <laughs> but if it happens once, then until you change it, it's, it's there's a very strong possibility that it will happen again. So if you just do it a second time and it goes better, don't think that that, is, uh, that has solved the problem. Okay? So... Try it once more. Show us how, when you're practicing, you find that. Okay. Okay. Now, good, good. You know, I hear something consistent, and that is good. Always consistent, even consistent wrong is good, because what's frustrating is if what sounds bad is changing all the time. Um, which E flat is sharper and which one is flatter? The first one is flatter, the fourth one is a bit sharp. The first finger is flatter. Okay. And has that been the case each time? Yes. Okay. So what you need now in this case, when I said, remember I said rethink the way you're playing it. So you try the same way, find one, then find four. But I would suggest don't reach us, don't, don't, Try to reach as far. Easy. Just an easy reach. It's better, right? Okay, try to find it one more time. Now you're, play your open D. And now you're E flat with your first finger. I'm just play the E flat, the, the first finger. Good. Okay. Now remember with whether it's with unisons or octaves, or fifths, sometimes we get so obsessed with tuning the notes to each other that we lose track of our center of pitch. And what happened was you were starting to get lower and lower, and they were in tune with each other, but they didn't sound like an E flat anymore. Okay, so just always remember that. Good. Okay. Good, good, good. So the, the, um, this process that we just went through with this open, I know this is only one example, but does that, can you imagine how that might carry over to other places where, let's say, an arpeggio, you keep missing, um, but how to rethink it, okay? And even using the same fingering, for example, um, but, you know, for it, let's say one up to four wasn't working, then you should definitely practice four down to one. Okay. Um, going, opening your hand backwards from the higher position is generally better to do. However, in this case, the four is in second position, which is never better. <laughs> <laughs> Never better to start from. So, you know, you have to pick your poison in this in this case. But I think this way is maybe maybe has hope for you. Um, now, this is the the surprise. The first real surprise here is we had this this incredibly dark these these trombones, um, terrifying sounds. But the B flat major, the sun came out suddenly. That should be a shock. And that sets us up for the. Okay. It was supposed to be a really stormy piece from that first chord, but then all of a sudden it turned. Okay. So can you surprise us right when you get. Smile, sun comes out, it gets warmer. Easy, easy. You're, I can see your, I can almost see um, your veins popping out of your hand from, <laughs> from opening your hand.
good. This is really, truly um, cadenza writing here. Even the way he notated it um, was in a kind of smaller print and not as, not as, um, not as clear in terms of the, the writing of the notes. So it's implying something more improvisatory. So maybe less solid, less solid a, a, a tone. And anyway, remember we, we got out of the dark and dramatic. Now it's more lighthearted, maybe fun even. Just, just fly up the whole. This is a surprise too, up here. So sometimes, yes, it's impressive. It's like a um, figure skaters. You know, they're they're doing their their beautiful routine, and then you can sense, oh, here comes the triple axle, right? And they get they get ready. They gather themselves, take a deep breath, and then they jump. Um, and that is that is great. It's and hopefully it goes really well. That's like this octave leap, but even more amazing when we don't set it up when it just happens in the course of the routine in the course of the piece and you don't um take time thinking about it and then take time but how about hold and then just shock us with this fun jump up there can you go from here much more exciting and um, you do have a habit normal very typical habit for violinists but I think this is going to, once you sort this out it's going to make everything so much easier for you the more notes you have in your left hand the faster you're playing then um, and the more stressed you are therefore you're grabbing the bow more okay? and um, it that starts to really compress our tone so it's not ringing as much. And it also, what it does is it's, so, and the reason it's compressing the tone is our string is not free. It's not ringing freely. And then what happens to make the notes come out, we have to try even harder with our left hand. So it starts to become a competition of work hard, squeeze more. So then this has to work harder. <laughs> it squeezes more. So play from... I know you can't see, but really loose fingers. When you did these, these, you were very beautifully soft. But then on these, you got a little bit frozen. Okay, so I'm trying to play those. Almost feeling like you're just playing them with your fingers, not your arm. Good, okay. This was great. You hear how you were al you almost were able to go faster. And on slurred notes, you're really going to feel, feel that. You're going to be able to fly faster. For these, I know we have to save our bow, right? Instead of feeling like you're um, creating your tone with your bow here, let your volume, Let's create the volume with your left hand articulation. Okay? So these are going to be very noisy the way they drop through the string. And this is just going to flow. Okay, can you try that? Just that down bow. That was good, good. And especially use this part of the bow. This makes such great tone, even when we're light. So we don't have to play into the string here and we can save bow. 
so then you can even end up here. That's great, 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 great. Okay, so you can try to put these put these together. The last thing we can do is maybe play play a few of these. Same thing. Once you start, you just flow with your bow. Make the volume with your left hand. That's great. Yeah. Did you? you it, it felt better, right? Yeah. So much easier actually for your for your left hand to do that and the sound was more brilliant it really popped out um, as opposed to you were stronger before but it was less brilliant um, and then the last thing is that you had a lot more range to that really amazing scale but when we are stuck into the string by squeezing we're really stuck with one sound. It stays into the string like that. Okay. Um, we don't have time to really cover the octaves at the end, but, but you're doing a really, really good job already. Same thing though, with it's just separate, separate bows instead of slur, but we don't want to be staying into the string if we're really staying deeply into the string then our left hand responds it the string responds so slowly to our left hand so what we really want to do is be released and i would so that comes with not squeezing and just uh, it's a little bit like that it's going to sound like bells but because of the left hand changing notes, it sounds very sustained. Okay? You won't have any problem with the tone. Okay? Um, so just allow the bow to fall through the string and then easy. It's going to feel floppy again. You were a little bit like this and you want to just feel floppy and then this is going to be a lot clearer. Sorry, Jerry, that our time is so short, but thank you for playing. Thank you. Let us leave. Um, we'll try to leave the last five minutes of the class or so for any, any quick questions. Sounds great. So we're ready to move on to our next performer. She is Amelia Canavo a student of Jay Freivogel, and Amelia is playing Rhapsody Number no. 2 by Jesse Montgomery. So this is a piece that I'm not familiar with, and maybe some of us, the rest of us aren't, so uh, Amelia will introduce that to our audience here as well as play it for you. Thank you. Really, I'm glad you're playing this. Um, Jesse Montgomery, just for a little little um, context for our audience, um, Jesse Montgomery is a beautiful, I mean, she's, she's a wonderful composer. She also is a beautiful violinist. And she was for many years um, one of the violinists of the Catalyst Quartet. And, um, and just actually left the Catalyst Quartet in, in the last few years because she got so busy as a composer. Um, but because of this, so you can say, in a way, she's like a Paganini of today, a violinist writing wonderful solo violin music. And um, that is why it, it, this a piece lies so well. It just sounds so, so great the way she utilizes um, the violin. Um, she's also very, it's just, she's a very beautiful composer as well. And you really see that in the in the slow section. So thank you, Amelia, for playing it.
you. So really great performance. Have you performed this before in front of people? Uh, not yet. So wow. Well, now you have. <laughs> um, really, really great. It's tricky. And um, this is, but this is also wonderful because this, we can continue a little bit um, the discussion that we were working with about sound production with Jaure. Um, if you think about, try to imagine making a violin sound, that a violin sound is like the path of a ball in the air. Okay, so let's say we want a, we want a, a forte sound. Well, I know there are many different kinds of fortes, but let's say it's a forte sound. That That is a, a, a ball that we're trying to throw over there, 30 feet over there. Okay, and the piano is going to be a, throwing a ball 10 feet. will be closer. That makes sense so far? Okay. Now, if that ball is going to be traveling through 30 feet, it's not traveling 30 feet because our hand that's holding the ball is traveling 30 feet. We're not holding it in the air and placing it 30 feet over there. We are putting a certain amount of energy into the ball and then we let it go and it flies 30 feet. And if we wanted to go 10 feet, we do less energy. You following me so far? Yes. Okay. Are you imagining how this is relevant to our sound production? Not really? Oh, and I'm just talking about in general. No, no, in general, making a sound. So let's say you want to make a, a, a louder sound. The first note, we can, let's take the first note of the piece as an example, just that A. Okay, to make that, that sounded that long, okay? It, I'm gonna hold it longer, okay? It's a longer note. I'm not actually throwing the ball. I'm not expending that energy all the way through the bow. I'm expending that energy right here and then I'm letting go. The rest of the bow actually is about this loud. It's about that light. But because I started it more, it ends up sounding really full. Now, can you kind of imagine? I think so. Okay. Try that first note and start the note, articulate it like you're going to play forte, and then lighten up, like almost like you're playing piano, except keep your bow moving. Keep your bow moving fast. Keep your bow moving fast, <laughs> very fast. No? Like this fast. That's right. And, and move it, keep it moving fast past the end of the tip. Yeah, you're still slowing down right before the tip. That's right. Actually, if you're really not slowing down, it's going to, I can't imagine. You're, you're going to follow through that much if you don't slow down. Exactly. Okay. That was pretty loud. Right. <laughs> okay, now do do the same, just a little slower. Just a little slower bow speed, which will result in a longer note. That's right. That sounded gigantic over here. I don't know how it did in the room. Did it sound pretty full? Yes. yes. Yeah. <laughs> it, was, it was really, really ringing. Um, was that a weird sensation just now? Really? It wasn't weird. No. Oh, okay. It was. It, what I mean. Well, I guess what I mean is, was that familiar or was it unfamiliar? Um. Probably familiar. 
Okay, do you think you can do that on the whole first line? Let's play it about this tempo. Okay, and after you start each bow, you're going to release a little bit like that, but keep the bow moving. Even lighter, after the beginning. That's right. Can you describe to me the difference in the sound? It felt clear. Clear, clear is good, right? It's more free. What did you say, the last thing? More free. More free, I, I would, I like clear and more free. <laughs> um, and try this now, even, especially when you put down a new finger, Articulate that even more, okay? While you're staying nice and released in the bow. That's great, keep going. Hey, good, and now I, Actually, I think you can lighten up even more and you will still get at least that much sound. Good. And as we go higher on the violin, this is one of the, I think, it's one of the most confusing things, counterintuitive things about playing the violin. Um, our higher strings require less and less weight to get them to start ringing, right? So the G string is the deepest. The G string requires the most weight into the string. And the E string requires the least. And as we go higher up each string, it becomes less and less. So, so when, when we're playing with this kind of weight up here, it just squashes, right? So... However, a lot of times in music, the easiest, the easiest way to make it more exciting is to go up. So composers go right higher, like here. Okay, that's the most open place so far. But if we push harder because we want more sound, then the sound squashes. So. How about as you go higher, lighter and lighter okay. as well, okay? That's good. No, it's, that's fine. And it was, um, I mean, already, I don't know if you could sense, it was just clearer okay, between the notes. And the faster we're going to play, the more released we need to be. Um, we just can't... It's going to sound very, very constricted. Okay, can you go on a little bit more um, from, from bar eight and continue this idea? It's, this is really great. Something that we just automatically do. We see two notes, we see double stops, and then we push harder. <laughs> and instead of double stops being that we're now playing two strings instead of one string, it's just changing the angle. But we don't want our tone to suddenly become. Okay. Also, this is something, and part of it is because sometimes there's a musical intensity from playing two notes. But what I try to remind myself is, I'm playing two notes, it's already going to be louder. So I don't have to make it louder. Okay? Just allow it to come out. Okay, so can you go from there? Hey, 
good, 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 good. And, and that's just something very, if you can, in general, on the violin, learn not to push harder just when we see more notes, you're going to, you're going to feel so good. You're going to sound so much, so much better. Um, I think it's one of the, one of the most stressful things for us is when we see more than one note at a time, right? <laughs> um, sometimes now with, with this is uh, you know rhapsody is such a perfect name for this piece it feels like um a harmonic fantasia um we're just kind of cycling through um various harmonies and various registers and and therefore hearing and seeing like a, almost like a kaleidoscope of of colors and sometimes you are bringing out those colors of the harmonies really beautifully and and then other times i start to hear um uh, i start to hear notes instead of a harmony i hear this and then this and then and this instead of more the ring of all of the notes together we don't want individual notes it doesn't it doesn't make any sense once we hear this starts to sound like computer computer sounds <laughs> um, so if you can really try to bring out the ring more than the actual notes themselves can you play from bar 13 again slowly each new harmony um, sound very different from the last. Yeah, that was, that was already better. I would Personally, I don't think that playing fast is the difficult part about this. It's just knowing what to do and how to color it. That's the most difficult part. And once you, once that is so familiar to you, then you'll be able to do it at any speed. You'll be able to do it at any, at, at any rhythm. So I would just practice it, enjoy practicing it just like you played it just now. It's a lot less stressful, and you can bring out a lot more. Play bar 20. That was the one measure where it got a little murky in the lower strings. Okay. So probably, it's probably you're shifting around. It's getting getting a little slurpy do you play piano at all i don't you don't um well i don't know if you can imagine this but imagine you have the pedal down the sustain pedal on a on a piano so you hear all that ring okay that's what we would love to have a sustain pedal in this piece and you hit those notes E flat, A flat, B flat, and make them ring like bells. And that's what we're talking about, the, the ring dominating the sound rather than the actual hitting the key. But... Good that you're doing it with vibrato and release the bow. That's already better, okay? Um, if you want the notes later in the slur to come out clearly, 
don't try to make it clear with the bow. Tr don't try to, to push the sound out of the A string. You're going to, after you release with the bow here, then fourth finger and third finger. That's going to give us the clarity. Okay, can you try it one last time? Better, better. Your left, you're getting your left hand and even lighter right hand. Even lighter bow. That was better already at the beginning, especially until you got to the until you got to the G string. Okay, so what this does, it, it just requires a little bit of at best at slow tempo, slow practice um, of recalibrating. You can feel like how one, it's almost like one hand is making the other hand do something. Uh, you, you articulate more with the left hand, then we don't release as much. And then we release with the right hand and then our left hand doesn't articulate as much. We, we want to get that, that combination going of a lot of clarity with the, with the left hand and always releasing with the bow. Um, I'm sorry that we're out of time. We said we would leave a few minutes for some questions, but you're playing it very, very beautifully already. <laughs> Mark, I don't know if you want to moderate any questions. Okay. I'm um, also, I know some people have to leave um, yeah. at 3.30, but if, if, if there are people who are saying, I'm, I'm happy to stay a few extra minutes. Okay. Great. Well, let's get, uh, how about some questions? Who's got a question? Or a comment? Helen. Uh, thank you so much for giving the class. Um, I was wondering, what do you listen to when you listen to a violinist perform? Did you, did you hear that? She said, uh, what do you listen to? First she said, thank you. But, um, <laughs> but what do you listen to when you listen to a violinist perform? That's a very interesting question. Uh, I've actually never really thought of it. I, so I guess maybe that's the first part of my answer is I'm not listening for anything in particular. It's more um, just kind of the letting the experience take me wherever it, wherever it takes me. And that could range from, uh, wow, this is heavenly and miraculous. I can't believe I'm here to all the way to... Oh my gosh! What are these screeching sounds? <laughs> um, it could. It's so interesting how different performers um, they pull your where they pull your your focus. And um, I was just telling one of my students this morning how uh, Yo Yo Ma, for example, one of the I know, just about my favorite performer. But you know, he doesn't make me listen to what a good cellist he is. He makes me think, wow, that piece of music is so beautiful. And, um, but then there will be somebody like uh, Yasha Heifetz, another one of my favorites. Um, Yasha Heifetz, I don't care what piece of music he's playing. You know, he could, he could be playing anything. I'm not listening to the music, I'm listening to him. And, and they're both great, each in their own, own way. So it's, it's sort of fascinating. I don't know if that, if that answers your question. Um, Follow up, Helen. Okay, you got a thumbs up over here. I'm the only one coming on screen. Amelia, what's your favorite Paganini caprice? Favorite, favorite, favorite to listen to or favorite to <laughs> listen to someone else? <laughs> because you know, there's like caprice is like number one, which are are so fun to hear someone else play it well. It's not fun to play myself. <laughs> um, number number eleven is really glorious. Um, I think it's. I don't know. It's so hard to say. Number two is very very special. Number two and six are the two most haunting. Um, and and number twenty four is still just the most unbelievably imaginative what to, to, to do all of that with this with such a simple little innocuous theme and where he took us um, 
Uh, but there's really, there is, each one of these caprices, they really are, are miracles. I don't know, anybody else? On this side of the room, other side of the room? I know, we, we uh, seem to be silent. I'm, um, I'm so thankful to you for your time with us. We're all grateful, and um, uh, especially for the work with these two students. Um, I just want to, before we uh, sign off here for the folks that are watching us, on the stream, um, uh, we want to thank Margaret Berry and Jeffrey Abrams, who are our sponsors of these uh, master classes. So we're able to connect with wonderful musicians like Mr. Kim. And um, we look forward to a, a few more as we're going through the spring here next weekend. Um, cellist um, um, Marcy, um, Mar Marcy Roseman will, will be, um, Marcy Rosen will be uh, with us on uh, next Saturday, so uh, next week is a cello afternoon. But um, Suvin, I want to thank you. Mr. Kim, I want to thank you. We've known, known you since ever uh, I came here to music prep, and we still wish they were in Philadelphia, but you're doing such amazing things in uh, the New England area, and uh, we're, we're happy uh, some of our students are, are uh, looking to uh, possibly join you there sometime. So um, thank you once again. A pleasure. Thank you. And thank you all, and go to chamber music. <laughs>